Thank you, Antonio. And good morning, everybody. It's a shame we have to sit all in here in such dark when it's so beautiful outside. But it's lovely to be back in Parma. This is my second time here. First time was on holiday, this time is on work, but I'll make some time. So I'm a learning scientist. Um, it's kind of going back to the basics. I look at fundamental mechanisms of how we learn, so all the way from physiological, neural, cognitive, social, and cultural mechanisms. And then I use them to design interventions and applications. And at the same time, I can look at any environment, or any application, or a method, and evaluate it vis-a-vis -vis the basic mechanisms of learning. And today, what I'm going to share with you is a side gig of mine, which started a few years ago uh, uh, because of the pandemic, when we started looking at flipped learning. It's an idea that is very popular, very familiar with, to all of you, I'm sure. Um, so let's look at what the basics of flipped learning tell us and the research around it. But I want to go back first into a time where I was a math teacher. So I taught math for four years uh, for grade 12 students. And as a math teacher, my philosophy was very simple. If I can explain the concept as clearly and as logically as possible and show them exactly what to do and how to think about it, perhaps my students would understand what I was talking about. So I did that. And students even liked my lectures, at least they said so. Right? Yet, when, you, when I tested them afterwards, I found that many of them could do what I was showing them, but you change a little bit, and they were completely lost. Right? That must be a story that's familiar to all of you as well, as I understand most of you are teachers and educators yourself. So what did I do when I found out the students, when my own students were not able to go just outside what I was trying to teach them, I would teach the same thing again. This time, even more clearly, more engaging, perhaps. You know, we call it remediation. And yet, the phenomena persisted. I could not, for the life of me, understand why was it that what I could see so clearly and explain, arguably very clearly as well, was not working. It was not working in the sense that they could do what I was trying to show them, but they could not adapt and you know, move on to novel things. You just had to change a slight thing, and they faltered. And later, as I became a learning scientist and I started to do my research, my PhD, and so on and so forth, that is really a current model of education. I know we don't know what might happen next week, but education practices are very persistent because education cultures are very persistent. And direct instruction is one of those methods that is so intuitive, as it was for me as a teacher, that if you want to teach a novice something new, the best way to do it is to just tell them exactly what to do and how to do it. What could possibly be wrong with that? Except for almost four decades now, we've known something is wrong for that, both in my experience and on the basis of research. And this was a study from Alan Schoenfeld out of Berkeley, a very <laughs> seminal paper, a catchy title, When Good Teaching Leads to Bad Results. And he and his colleagues went into math classrooms, and these math classrooms were taught by very good math teachers. Right? And if you observe these classrooms and say, yeah, this is a really good lecture, this is a very good teacher. If you ask the students, just like I did mine, they too would say, yeah, I could understand everything that the lecturer was saying. Yet, when you came out and you, know, you assessed them on conceptual understanding and transfer, the understanding was really shallow. Exactly, if you change slightly, they would falter. Hence, the disasters of well-taught mathematics courses. And it's a phenomenon not just in math, it's more universal. And I use this, both my experience and this study, to articulate the problem of initial learning, the problem of learning that we're trying to counter. Because if you don't understand the problem, you won't hit the solution that works, right? So the problem is not that we learn poorly from bad lectures. I hope this is not a bad lecture, <laughs> but if it is, you'll learn very poorly. The problem is that we learn poorly from very good ones, so I don't expect you to take a lot out of this today, <laughs> even if I'm good. But you have to understand the problem. The problem is that we learn poorly from very good lectures. And there are several reasons from a cognitive standpoint that we understand now why that is the case. Okay? But that's the problem. And against this backdrop of the problem, 
we started to look at, is flip learning a solution to this problem? Yeah. So let's look at flip learning. And this culminated in a paper that I wrote with my colleague John Hattie and our two uh, senior postdocs at the time, Irina and Tanmay. And I'm going to share some of the thinking and the work that went into this uh, paper. Uh, this was published about two years ago. So if you look at flip learning, it's a, first a direct instruction, like I said. It's really a method where you instruct, where you have instruction in the classroom, typically, followed by more application and problem solving. So very simply put, it's instruction first, even very good instruction, hopefully first, followed by application, problem solving, and so on and so forth. The idea of flipped learning, as we understood from the research, from our review, was, well, let's take the instructional component, which is deemed to be passive, mostly, to an online modality, so that you can save classroom time for more uh, active learning, problem solving, and so on and so forth, okay? And so that was flipped learning. Take the passive component of classroom instruction online. So, Basically, it's a passive online modality followed by an active, supposedly an active in-class modality. However, if you think of the learning method, when you're coming to learn and understand something new, the pedagogy remains the same. It's instruction first, followed by problem solving or an application. There is no change, per se, in the method. The, the learner is going through the same process. They, they see a lecture or a video, followed by problem solving and application class. And therefore, from a basic cognitive mechanism standpoint, we should not see any change in the effects on learning. Although, it would be very surprising <laughs> that if the underlying pedagogy is the same, that we start to see any effects. That would be very surprising. And the only way to find this out was to actually do a meta-analysis of all the flipped learning interventions against traditional instruction. So, when we started looking at meta-analysis, we already found that there were 46, at the time, right? Ours was the 47th. There were 46 meta-analyses already. And, they were all, and many of them were pointing to a positive effect of flipped learning. So, we were wondering, what's going on? Right? Second, we, out of all these flipped learning interventions, we, we culled out the ones that were really good, strong experimental studies. We found 173 studies on flipped learning. And it is on these that we started to do a meta-analysis. So here's the first finding. We found, contrary to what we thought, because the underlying pedagogy is the same, we found there was a positive effect in favor of flipped learning. And it was not a small effect, it's a 0.4. It's about a year of schooling effect. So this is a, a very good effect size in educational interventions. So what's going on? We did find there was a lot of heterogeneity. In other words, there's no true effect size here because there's a lot of variation around this mean effect size. That means sometimes it was working very well, sometimes it was on our, at, the, at the midpoint, and other times it was not working very well. So we wanted to find out why is it What's mediating this variation around the mean effect size? And that's where we went back to looking at coding the flipped learning interventions. It turns out that nobody, at least by that time, nobody had actually bothered to look at what was happening both online and offline or in classrooms, what kinds of activities were taking place in these flipped learning interventions, right? And so we coded them for active learning versus passive learning. And what do I mean by, by that? So you, you probably have heard of Mickey Chi's ICAP framework, um, interactive, constructive, active, and passive. And the idea is that as you design activities that are passive, you move them up to active, to more constructive, and then interactive, the learning effects increase steadily. That's the, th that's the thesis, right? And she's shown through multiple studies that this broad pattern kind of maintains, right? And so we'd use the similar, def similar definitions of active versus passive. We didn't break it down into four categories. We just broke it down into two, active versus passive. We went into each paper and we looked at what was happening online, what kinds of activities were designed online, right? There were readings, there were videos, there were quizzes, there were PowerPoints, and so on and so forth, which is as what you would expect 
in the online modality of a flipped intervention. And then we went and looked at what was happening in class. Was there problem solving? Was it, was it clickers? Was it group work? Et cetera, et cetera. And we, for each paper, we coded them into these categories. So now we had a good sense that if people are saying that this is a flipped learning intervention, what exactly, at least in the broad course categories of active versus passive learning, what was happening? And what do we find? So this is where it gets really interesting. So remember, the average effect of flipped learning was positive, and it was a fairly strong effect of a year of schooling, right? So where is that effect coming from is what we dived in, dove into next. Well, we found that the, in all the flip, in, in, on average, there were more passive online activities, as expected, but we also found that the in-class activities were also very passive. Okay? In other words, the quality of implementation in many of the flipped learning uh, studies was not consistent with their basic hypothesis that let's move passive online and active in class. It turns out it was more passive online, as expected, but also more passive offline. So in other words, the effect was coming from passive learning activities. If this is working, yeah, because there was low prevalence of active learning overall. And even when active learning was present, this really surprised us that the effect was not, it did not create an effect. Right? So think about this, you have an average effect that's strong, but it's really coming from passive and more passive learning activities. And so much so that if there was active learning designed for, it was not creating an effect. Okay? The largest impact of flipped learning interventions was when there was actually a lecture in class, which totally defeats the purpose of flipped learning. Right? It's like if you have to go video online, and then you have to come back in class to give a lecture, basically you're saying the video didn't work, I have to redo something, right? So this is just data-driven analysis of what we say is flipped learning, right? So clearly it's not because of any active learning mechanisms, it's really because of more passive, more on-time, more lecturing, and so on and so forth. And this is a finding that I find really intriguing and also predictable that in some interventions where the, where the, the classroom implementation also in, included active learning, the effect of flipped learning over classroom teaching vanished. So, in other words, if you want to improve even the direct instruction model, just do more active learning. Forget the modality. Yeah. And what this is a missed promise, really. You know, this is a perfect example of how we have a case of digitization without any transformation, because the underlying pedagogy remains the same, and the passive nature of learning remains the same. The average effect is like, likely coming from more time on task and more instruction. And that was causing the effect. So very depressing. But there was a beacon. <laughs> In some of the flipped learning interventions, people had carried out problem-solving activities prior to instruction. And that was producing a significant effect. In other words, before people received any instruction or lecture, in some flipped learning interventions, they started by doing problem-solving activities. And that started to show an effect of learning. Which, if you're familiar with my research, which is my main body of research on productive failure, which, we talk, which I talked about, um, that's very consistent with what productive failure is. And so the idea then came to us that how do we design flipped learning in a way that's consistent with the productive failure effect. So I'll just segue here very quickly to talk about what the logic of productive failure was. And this actually came forth from my early <laughs> experiences as a teacher, the math teacher, as I was talking to you about. And the idea here was simple. If learning from failure is intuitive and compelling, we shouldn't wait for it to happen. We should intentionally, deliberately design for failure in a safe way and bootstrap that for learning. And so this is 20 years of research, a book is coming out on how uh, this method works and how effective this is. So it's a two-phase design. We start with problem solving, uh, carefully designed problem solving uh, that leads to failure intentionally. And then after students have gone through that, 
you follow it up with instruction. So what we were finding in the flip learning meta-analysis meta was quite consistent with this, that people, sometimes teachers intuitively <laughs> have done a good thing, started with problem-solving activities, and then gone into instruction. So, and this productive failure effect, also another, other meta-analyses have also showed that this effect is also very strong compared to direct instruction, uh, around 0.6 if you do it well, which is more than a year of cooling. So, several studies, uh, 166 about two years ago, have shown this effect, okay? So you have a flipped learning effect, which is very strong of a year of schooling coming from direct, coming from more passive instruction. And then you've got the productive failure effect that is more active learning, problem solving followed by instruction that's, that's even stronger, that's coming from a meta-analysis as well. And then there is a subset of flipped learning interventions that seem to follow the productive failure model roughly that also show a positive effect. So we weren't looking for it, but we came across it. So back to the flipped learning model then. So then we decided to say, okay, if you want to do flipped learning, what would work, given what we know from the data, from the meta-analysis, and the, the body of research on productive failure, which kind of came together serendipitously. So the idea was then to develop this model, and we called it the 4F model. Fail, flip, form, and feed, right? And so the, the first phase, if you want to do a flip learning intervention, is the fail phase. And here the focus is on problem solving in a safe space. So can we create safe spaces for students to generate to multiple solutions to problems? These problems are new problems for which they may not have the knowledge to solve these problems, but still they're designed in a way that they can generate some ideas and solve them. Whether correctly or incorrectly, it doesn't matter. But that's the space within which they discover what they know, the limits of what they know, and so on and so forth. So that's the starting point of learning. Then you go into the flip mode. Having, gener having done the fail phase, now is the time to give them some content. It could be through videos, could be through activities, could be through reading notes. And research shows that if you've tried something, and this is my own work and other work, other research as well, that having tried something and not having achieved the correct outcomes, if you then read some, some uh, explanatory notes or watch a video, it makes a lot more sense and you learn a lot more if that happens. So the second phase is the flip phase where you provide that instruction, you provide the expert knowledge and you can do it in many interesting and engaging ways and this time it would work on the back of having failed. Next phase is the form phase, and this is where you could potentially in reintegrate the lecture into the class, because lecture from an expert actually has value. You just have to time it well. We just, the problem in, in the direct instruction model, as I see it, is that we don't time it well. So the form feed is absolutely important where you need to deliver that expert lecture, and deliver, deliver it in interesting and engaging ways. Right? And finally is the feedback. So you do the problem solving and you provide multiple modalities of feedback, either through group work or instruction or tutorials or so on and so forth. And that creates the full pipeline of fail, flip, form and feed. Right. That's it. So the fail phase, flip phase, fix or form phase and the feed phase. That's the 4F model. And we wanted to see if this works. Could we apply this in a meaningful way, in a real ecology, in, uh, you know, at some, in some context. So I want to share some evidence with you. This is the work of my PhD student, together with a math professor at ETH Zurich. And we targeted, as I always do, as a proof of concept, the most difficult math course a first-year undergraduate student can take. And it's not analysis, it's linear algebra. Silence, right? So that means it is. <laughs> so this is the large course about this, this size. 700 students take it, and it's compulsory, and everybody has to take it. And it follows a pretty much the direct instruction model. The lecturer goes into a big hall, delivers the lecture every week for a couple of hours, and then there are tutorial sessions after where students break into these tutorial groups, and they do problem solving and application of what they've learned. Right? And this is, again, a very good, Norbert is a really good lecturer, and he's lectured this for many, many years. What we did was to design the fail phase 
and said, okay, we can't change much of the regular modality because it's a massive lecture, it's been going on for years. Let's design the fail phase. And so we inserted 30 to 45 minutes of problem-solving activities before key lectures. Right? So we have a year-long lecture, uh, this, the course, and we took five big ideas from semester one and five big ideas from semester two. And for these five or ten overall ideas, we designed problem-solving activities given prior to the lecture that would cover those concepts to solve those activities. Right? So that's the key. These problem-solving activities are given prior to the lecture that covers those concepts. So we expect students will struggle. We expect students will not be able to solve them. And they're also designed in particular ways so that they can explore while struggling. Right? So these are not standard problems. But they last about 30 to 45. And we, deliver, we ask them to do these online prior to the lectures. We explain to the student the logic model of this. We explain that research shows that this would be effective, that when they come, then come back, come to the lecture on the topic, they will understand the lecture better. So we had that renegotiated that didactic contract because we want to create this safe space. But we did this. So 10 of these 30 to 45 minute sessions, in other words, our overall intervention time across the entire year was about seven to eight hours. That's it. Okay? Seven to eight hours of surgically designed intervention time based on the 4F model and the productive failure model. Right? The historical passing rate, and in Switzerland we have the model where it's easier, easy to get into the university, but it's hard to stay in. So the, so the historical passing rate of this is 55%. Half of the class does not pass this. So here's a, here's a question to you. In your context, if you were to be able to, des to design this, a year-long course which takes hundreds of hours of investment of time, and you will have a seven-hour intervention spread across the whole year, how much do you think we could move the needle on the 55%, if at all? This is not a rhetorical question. I want somebody to jump up and say, one percent. <laughs> Go up to eighty percent. Aren't you optimistic? <laughs> but I, I, I love the enthusiasm and the optimism. Any other takers? Five percent. Yeah, five percent would be a strong effect of a very good teacher. By the way, so you've got five percent, and you've got twenty-five percent heterogeneity at work. Right. So what we found was, and we did this over, because it's design research, we did this over multiple iterations. In the first year, we could improve the needle by 10%. In the second year, we could improve it by another 10% as we brought it to high fidelity. COVID happened, it went down to, so 20%, it went down to 15%. The data is not there. My PhD student just graduated last year, and she showed that now that things have stabilized, the last implementation was back to 20%. Okay? So think about that. We didn't do any fancy modalities, any fancy tech, nothing. We just stuck to the basics. We looked at what the data was telling us. We looked at what research and productive failure was telling us. We designed a surgical intervention only that, la that lasted only seven hours over the course of the whole year. And we moved the needle and kept it there, importantly, at 20% improvement. And that's what you can achieve if you stick to the basics. Right? So I return to the problem. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I return to the problem. I, sh I shared with you at the start, the problem was not that we learned poorly from bad lectures, but we learned poorly from very good ones. And I've shown you in the flipped learning literature how that is not happening, but given the data that we have from the meta-analysis, but also a way forward that if you were to redesign it in ways that are consistent with what we know from that research, as well as from related research on productive failure, that we can, receive, we can achieve very powerful effects on learning. Right? With that, I thank you.